So good afternoon, everyone, and you're all very welcome to our webinar this afternoon, Business Ideas for Resilient and Sustainable Future. My name is Liam Fister, Business Incubation Manager in the Maori Center, SFI Maori Center, and I'm also the National Marine Incubation Manager funded by Enterprise Ireland. I'm joined today and I will be coordinating with my colleagues, Tara Reddington and Aoife Dunn, for the next hour and a half or so, and um, coordinating what we think are some brilliant um, panelists and contributors. So we hope you enjoy today. Um, I'll very shortly be handing over to uh, Professor Brian Gallagher, who is a Professor of Ener Energy Engineering and co-director co of the Maori Centre. But in order to orientate ourselves first, maybe I will go through an agenda and our objectives for today. So, so the agenda. So we have Professor Brian shortly. Um, from 2.15 to 2.45, we have short presentations from Brendan Goss, who is um, European Incubation Programs Manager in Tangent in Trinity College, Dublin. Ratna Nelapatati, who is ESB Innovation Manager, a strategic lead in ESB. Uh, Neve Collins, who manages the new AgTech Innovation Center in UCD, which is in planning, and Donald Grant, who is Executive Director of the Ocean Startup Project in Canada. From 2.45 to 3.05, we'll have a panel discussion with, with the presenters above, and I'll be suggesting that as we go along, if you have any questions or any comments, please use the Q&A function at the top of your screens. So from 3.05 then to 3.30, we will launch our Masterclass Series and Sustainable Business Ideas Competition. And I'll be in conversation for this part of, of proceedings with uh, our expert facilitators, Ronnie Mink and Judy Russell. If you have, as I've mentioned, any questions or comments as we move along, please use the Q&A function. And given the week that's in it in Ireland, uh, we'll use the hashtag Ireland to zero as our hashtag for those who are on social media. So the significance, I suppose, of this week from, from a sustainability, a sustainable future perspective in Ireland is that we had the announcement that the cabinet on Tuesday approved the revised climate action bill, which was a very significant step, I suppose, in terms of um, the ambition for climate action in Ireland. It, it's looked at pursuing and achieving carbon neutrality no later than 2050. And part of that process uh, is in creating five-year carbon budgets for various sectors to um, adhere to. And in Listening to the commentary around this on, on Tuesday, and, and I heard Mary Donnelly, who is chair of the Climate Action, uh, Climate Chain, Change Advisory Committee, who will be advising the government on the five-year carbon budgets. Um, Mary is also a, a member of the Governance Committee in Mary. I heard her speak about the challenges this will, will pose for all sectors, really, in terms of getting to carbon neutrality by 2050. But she very quickly moved the conversation from the challenges in sectors to the various opportunities that are being created by this ambitious plan uh, for Ireland. Um, opportunities in technologies, opportunities for new jobs, opportunities in business. And, and that really, I suppose, is what we are looking to focus on over the next hour and a half, the various opportunities and the various uh, supports that are available for all of us involved in the climate crisis and more broadly involved in looking at sustainability into the future. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to hand you over now to Professor Brian O'Gallagher. So Brian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Liam. Um, and I'm delighted to uh, to be here today. Uh, I can't seem to start my video. Oh, there I am. 
Um, and uh, this is a very important event, and uh, I, I congratulate Liam on organising it. And uh, what, what I'd like to do is just to put it into a small bit of context in terms of um, Marai uh, as a centre and um, some of the other things we, we do. So our mission in Marai is to do excellent research with significant societal impact. Uh, the excellent research is in the areas of energy, climate and marine, and the significant impact is in the areas of supporting industry, informing policy and empowering communities. And I want to talk a bit about the one relating to supporting industry. Um, we have kind of th three branches of uh, engagement with industry partners uh, that kind of encapsulates some of uh, our collaboration with industry. So the first one is that we collaborate with um, generally smaller companies to develop ideas into economic activity. So they might come to us with an idea, uh, they want some research carried out to see if that idea can be turned into something that might generate jobs and uh, generate income. And two examples I'd give there would be a, a cove-based company, Ocean Energy, who we've worked with for a number of years to develop a wave energy device. And we did work with them on the design, uh, lab testing, uh, ocean testing, um, various uh, steps along the way, we supported them through research. And they now have a, um, a wave energy device that they're testing in Hawaii. Uh, so that's one example. Another example would be G Kinetic, uh, again, a small uh, company in Ireland who developed tidal energy technologies. And again, we helped them with design, with uh, the testing in the lab, with the, the mathematical modeling. And, um, and then the detailed engineering. So the research that we did, depending on what stage they were at in terms of the, the readiness of the technology. But our journey with them has been one of um, turning ideas into economic activity. The second way in which we support industry is in terms of reducing their carbon footprint. So increasingly, um, as Liam said, uh, in an Irish context, the, the, the policy ambition has been really tightened yesterday with the publication of this government approved bill or new legislation, which sets us on a path to zero by 2050 and uh, also adds a uh, short term ambition to reduce our emissions, greenhouse gas emissions by a half by 2030. So the way in which we've been supporting companies in this, there's two examples, um, the pharmaceutical sector down in Ring of Skiddy. Uh, so our research on intelligent efficiency, we use that in collaboration with them to look at their data and see how they could change things in order to reduce their energy bill and maximize the use of energy efficiency. Then they uh, were encouraged by this and wanted to go a step further and look at bringing renewable energy on site. So they installed wind turbines. And again, we helped them with the analysis and with the integration of the wind energy into their system. So the, that's the second example uh, in terms of how we supported industry. The third one then is in helping them develop strategic plans for the future, harnessing the opportunities that arise from this transition to a low carbon future. And two examples here would be work we've done with ESB, helping them develop and sharpen and fine tune their brighter future strategy, which focuses in their case on electrification of heat and transport and decarbonizing electricity. Gas Networks Ireland then we've also helped in this way and they released a strategy last year focusing on decarbonizing the gas network. And it builds on the collaborative research they've done with Marai. So that's just some of the examples of how we've supported industry. And in addition to supporting industry, and this is where today is, is very important from my perspective, there's also, of course, the opportunity for researchers themselves to take ideas forward. And not necessarily, uh, 
just to support industry to take their ideas forward, but what about the researchers themselves who have ideas and want to turn them into business opportunities? And that's the real benefit of today from my perspective. And it's great to see 130 people online and to, to see how it, uh, it can be possible for you as researchers to be guided through the process of how you can turn your research findings into economic activity. So I'm delighted uh, and I want to thank Liam for inviting me to, to open today's session. I think it's a very important session. Unfortunately, I can't stay, uh, but I will uh, check in with Liam afterwards to see how it goes. And uh, I'm very enthused by the attendance, by the programme and by what it is you will be endeavouring to do. So back to you, Liam. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brian, and uh, and thank you for making the time to come and and chat with us today. Because I, I know it was it was difficult for you to find the first time, so I appreciate it. And, and to reiterate one of the points there, which I think is so well made, is around researchers looking to take their um, their ideas forward and the opportunities that are presented for researchers in that regard. I think is. Um, is something that we are all very conscious of in the Maori Centre and we want to support that. And as well as that, all of our startup colleagues who are online at the moment, um, startups, spin-outs, anybody that has an entrepreneurial idea, we're, we're interested in that. So we'll, we'll move on now to our um, first presenter. Our first presenter is Brendan Goss. Brendan is um, European Accelerator Program Manager in Tangent in Trinity College, Dublin, and uh, is involved in the EIT Climate Kick Accelerator Program, is involved in an accelerator around digital health, and also in an accelerator around materials. So, Brendan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Liam. Gur mil magat, gur magat devrian. Thanks, everybody, for bringing us in. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you all see that? Now, as I say, thanks, thanks, Liam. Um, I am the European Accelerator Manager in Tangent in Trinity College in Tangent is the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center of the university. Um, we're a relatively new organization, um, but we were somewhat rebranded in recent times, about 12, 18, 20, 24 months ago, uh, as the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center, having created a, somewhat of a legacy within the university around innovation and research. Um, <clears throat> the organization itself is both um, inward facing in terms of its engagement with the schools and faculties and research and academic community within the university in terms of harnessing and embracing innovation and trying to inculcate entrepreneurship across the university. But it also has an external face, um, which is my job to a large extent, which involves engaging with startups in the ecosystem, not just in Ireland, but across Europe as well. So. I would run a number of different initiatives which comprise European Irish startups across a number of different verticals, which I'll go into now shortly. But Trinity basically, or, or Tangent, I should say, is, is that uh, meeting point, if you like, between innovation and entrepreneurship, where we try to imagine new opportunities, harness the power of collaboration and diversity, and, and trying to try to create a positive impact uh, on the world by way of uh, generating new business ideas. So a little bit of, um, listen, I've got a free opportunity here to do a bit of boasting. As a university, we're very well established. We're only about 400 years old or so. So we've had plenty of time to get our act together, but we've generated a huge amount of activity in terms of um, leading, leading edge research. We, um, we have a very good track, track record in terms of industry engagement between a lot of the ideas uh, that are germinated in the university and that are spun out either as industry engagements or even as, as startup companies. Um, and amongst the student population, we have a very strong track record in, in, in graduate 
uh, for entrepreneurship as well. We do a lot of programs both in the in the education sphere within within Tangent, which encourage people to take part in uh, postgraduate certificate programs, which involve degree of innovation and entrepreneurship. Also help professionals who um, who require some form of uh, relearning or retooling, if you like, in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation within their own organization. So it's a form of intrapreneurship, uh, if you like. Um, and we've had a, a lot of student companies or student entrepreneurs have gone on to successfully create companies as well in recent years. So that's something we're also very proud of. Liam mentioned the EIT initiative uh, a few moments ago. The EIT initiative is a, a community initiative across Europe uh, which consists largely of universities, research centers, but also has industry partners. Um, now the pillars that EIT that, that we're particularly interested in in Trinity are, are where we're a core member, if you like, or a core partner of the community um, are listed amongst this little cross section on the infographic. So Climate Kick, Digital Health and Raw Materials would be our primary kind of areas of focus. Um, but EIT as an organization the European Institute for Technology and Innovation is somewhat of an abstract um, construct in that it's not a physical university as such. It's, it's a virtual collaboration uh, network across Europe, whereby we combine forces um, and pool, pool uh, expertise and intelligence and try to put into effect the, the best of research, the best in class of research to try to make an impact at both societal level and in terms of job creation but ultimately in terms of making the world a better place for uh, European citizens to live in. So we basically empower innovators and entrepreneurs to develop world-class solutions to confront societal challenges. The primary one, I guess, uh, and the one with most um, resonance for us today is our activity around Climate Kick, which is one of the bigger uh, climate uh, or EIT pillars, I should say. And Trinity has run a number of accelerators in recent years, specifically germane to the to the world of, of sustainability and circularity, given the broad uh, acronym of Climate Kick. So we would have uh, generated a fair amount of activity, uh, put how many, 38 to 40 startups through our accelerator program in the last two or three years. Um, as, as a rule, we don't take equity in, in these companies that participate in our program. So we're, we're different to your traditional private accelerator initiative. What we do is we provide grants to the companies that participate. The companies are evaluated independently, so it's quite a competitive process. But across those 40 companies, the guts of a half a million euro in grants has been dispersed. And some of those companies have gone on in recent years to raise about 6 million euro in seed capital, which is pretty good considering they come in as very embryonic ideas to us in the first instance. So that 6 million has been raised in the last two years primarily. And over 60 jobs have been created. And I've just put a, a little slide up there with some of the company's names. The one that resonates most fondly with me are the, the Bounce Back Recycling startup, which emerged out of the Galway Traveller community. And their, their basic business model is to collect mattresses um, uh, and, and collect mattresses from houses that are dumped and therefore basically take them away from landfill. Uh, because mattresses, obviously, as you might know, don't decompose terribly well. But they've, they've created a huge business opportunity and are working very busily now, across, particularly across the West and Northwest of Ireland. Raw materials is an interesting one. Um, this, this is born largely as an activity out of manufacturing and mining space. So the primary industry, uh, the principles and philosophies of the circular economy come into play very much with raw materials. A lot of the time you'll see kind of heavy third level research ideas that are germinated in that space uh, are helped and harnessed by the raw materials uh, initiative. Um, but really what, what we're trying to do here is again mitigate the damage done through uh, the manufacturing, the heavy industry processes, refining materials, cut down the waste associated with them and ensure that we have more innovative um, reuse and recycling processes at the end of these manufacturing um, and processing supply chains. So really it's, it's around substituting, uh, the substitution, if you like, of critical materials uh, and rather the redesigning and the repurposing of products and services for a circular economy. And circularity is a really key part of the sustainability conversation. We're also involved as it happens, running an accelerator for the Irish Manufacturing Research Center, 
and their circular initiative at the moment, which encourages Irish startups uh, to in incorporate more circular philosophies into their business models. Liam touched on a, a, another EIT climate or EIT kick vertical, which is that of EIT health. There's a lot of crossover activity, um, at least it is encouraged across the community that we cross over between pillars like health and climate and so on because of the impact it has on society and populations in general. But in terms of our own record with digital health, we, we've encouraged the development of not just uh, the business creation ideas of startups, but also innovation ideas that students as well come up with. So we would run students through particular programs and formats um, encouraging them to ideate and develop ideas or creative solutions that they might have. We do this not just in health, but also in climate. Um, and this has led to some really, really interesting and innovative uh, stuff in recent years. Again, feeding into the pipeline of startup creation. But amongst the startups themselves who we've worked with and who have come through our program in the last couple of years, um, I've mentioned a few there, Limerick-based Trackworks, who've done very well in recent years. A lot of these companies have, uh, have seen the pandemic as an opportunity to develop their solutions very successfully. So tracks for, track works are one of those. Uh, Wallola is another. Um, so again, these companies have gone on to raise a lot of seed cap in, in recent years because they've been recognized as having serious com commercial potential. Uh, and they've seen the pandemic, fortunately, some of them at least, as an opportunity rather than a, a crisis to be ignored. So just to conclude, um, really what, what we try to do within our, our engagement with EIT in particular, but even more generally, you know, notwithstanding what we do with EIT, but in terms of our engagement with startup and innovation on the ground and taking sustainability very much as a kind of a, a, a central component of that approach, is we try to create business ideas, capture these ideas and, and uh, harness them and cultivate them within the, the kind of ecosystem that we manage, ultimately helping them to deliver uh, and create projects with collaborative partners across Europe that might lead to either businesses as spin-outs or even innovation projects across the research community. And ultimately then, whatever companies or ideas are born of that process, when the ideas are slightly more advanced, this so-called TRL level, then we try to and then encourage the networking and matchmaking opportunities that are uh, open to us across this European network, which is very wide and deep. So that's basically what we do in, in Tangent. Um, Hope that was of interest to you. I think I had six minutes. I was waiting for the bells to, to ring, but they haven't rung yet. So I guess I'm on time. Liam? Tara, I can start my video. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Brendan. Bang on time, I would say. Um, so that's... That's brilliant. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? You know, you, you speak about bounce back recycling there and, and the importance of circularity. And this is something we, we, we might come back to in the panel discussion. But, you know, the technologies don't have to be always very high tech, really, is, is kind of the thing that struck me, right? And, and circularity is so important um, and reusing of components and so on and so forth. So very interesting. Correct. So next, up, next up, we have Ratna Nelapati. Ratna leads uh, strategy and innovation within ESB, um, providing solutions to various parts of the ESB group. And, and she's also very involved in the free electrons program, which she'll talk about now. So Ratna, over to you. Thank you, Liam. I'm just going to share my screen. Can everyone hear me OK? I'm hoping everyone can see the screen. Um, thank you, Liam, again for the introduction and for the opportunity. My name is uh, Ratna Nelapati. I'm the Innovation Manager at ESB. And I'm going to talk about free electrons, as Liam said, which is the world's first global energy startup accelerator program. And uh, I'm very proud to say that ESB is a co-founder of this program. So just to set a little bit of context in terms of um, the challenges, um, Liam and Brian alluded to the Climate Action Plan. Ireland has committed to reducing the emissions by 7% annually 
And every one of us, including you and I and, and ESV is no exception that we have to contribute to the 7% reduction. But we are facing unprecedented challenges uh, and disruption in this industry. And just to give you a very small example in terms of you know, the level of disruption that we're facing, you all must have heard about GAFA. Yes, GAFA. The average age of GAFA is 22 years. And in less than that, they have managed to disrupt many industries, including media, retail, financial, telecommunications, some to speak. And now they are disrupting the energy industry. Yes, you're right. Um, they have been buying power, selling power, and they've been investing heavily in uh, renewable energy as well. And they're mainly doing that mainly because um, what corporates haven't managed to do in the last number of years, they have managed to get access to you and I as customers, and they're very, very good at that. So utilities, including ESB, are now taking courage in making their own innovation pivot. They're trying to foster new business model innovation. I suppose the other key challenge that we have is, you know, we love to innovate. Uh, Everybody is going to talk about, you know, how, 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 how we want to innovate. But we're desperately slow. Uh, we're like ocean liners, uh, very difficult to steer when it comes to innovation pace. So utilities are spurring innovation by collaborating with startup companies, um, you know, because they are fantastic in providing pioneering solutions. And I suppose the third key challenge is from today's perspective, I suppose, is no one utility, no one government, no one startup, no one individual has monopoly on wisdom or on capital. So I suppose what we're trying to do is we're trying to create ecosystem. And you can see there are a number of challenges and we have solutions for those challenges. But again, the solutions are very fragmented. And identifying that gap, we decide to take a big leap of faith um, by establishing free electrons. And you might wonder what this free electrons is. Imagine a world and a time when electrons are gonna be free. Yes, you're right. Um, just like telecommunications industry, you know, where the voice, the data, the minutes, everything is actually free for customers now, we are hoping to actually make electrons free someday. That's our ambition. So free electrons, it's a, um, a global utility collaboration where nine utilities from different parts of the world, you can see on the screen, right from Australia to Asia to America to Middle East to Europe, these nine utility companies have come together to create a startup, yes, startup called Free Electrons to address the challenges that I um, just talked earlier on. Ap apologies, Ratna, um, we're having trouble with your video. If I could ask you to try and turn on your video, please, thank you. Okay, let me just see. Um, I have to just go back and see if I can turn on. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you, Ratna. You can see me there, yeah? Okay, I'm just going to go back. Sorry about the disruption. One more disruption. Um, so what exactly is Free Electrons? Free Electrons is about really kind of building a better radar to attract startup companies from all over the world who have next-gen ideas. And many of you in the audience, I'm sure, are, are those entrepreneurs who have these fantastic ideas. Um, I suppose what it's it's like a global marketplace where utilities are looking to find solutions, looking to find partners, and looking to find new business models. What do utilities bring to the table here? As as Liam alluded earlier on, that you know, um, with the climate crisis, we all have a common goal: decarbonization, decentralization, and digitalization. And I suppose we are from different parts of the world. So we are not competing with each other. So we're happy to kind of, you know, share our learnings, share our experience. And more than anything, you know, we're willing to bring all that to the table, uh, including our customer base and the capital. And finally, um, we're very passionate, as you heard me say that, you know, we love to innovate and we want to bring that passion and energy and commitment to the table. What do startups bring? You know, startups are providing us with these disruptive technologies or solutions which help us not only innovate new business models, but also help us reduce our operational cost, help us um, improve the performance of our assets. And as I said, you know, if we are ocean liners, startups are really like the speedboat, you know, with their pace. Um, the journey so far, this is a very powerful slide. Um, you know, as you can see, it's all about the numbers. And if any of the researchers are in the audience, you'll, you'll love the slide. Um, 
you know, we are in the fourth year of, fifth year of this uh, program. And in the last four years, we have been building a, a sustainable and impactable presence in the global innovation space. Um, significant traction from the startup community in the world. As you can see, we've received applications from over 75 countries, um, over 2,000 applications. And we have invested over $50 million in startup community. And I suppose one of the key advantages, as I said, is the commercial impact of this, you know, where no one UTT could have done those 170 plus pilots, you know. So that's the beauty of this program where the nine utilities have managed to do over 170 pilots where we learn and share the experience. And I suppose the key point here is with the nine utilities, you know, we are bringing the customer base of 80 million customers um, for the startups to actually get access to. And finally, I suppose the point here is um, Stanford University and St. Gallens University from Zurich are studying free, uh, free electrons as an example for open innovation ecosystem. Um, just a very quick peek into the program itself, this year program. Um, as you can see, the applications are closing on the 29th of March. So if you know any startup company in Ireland or outside of Ireland who, who, who has a technology or a solution um, that is worth to explore, um, to be considered by the utilities, do encourage them to apply for this. We go through a very rigorous kind of, you know, shortlisting process um, with the nine utilities reviewing the application that we receive from all over the world. And we finally shortlist them for a boot camp stage where 30 companies would be shortlisted. And we literally have a pinata session with those 30 companies to select further 15 going through the entire program where they refine their strategy and work on the business opportunity with the utility companies. I've highlighted the last bit there, which is the finale. ESB will be hosting the finale in November from 9th of November to the 11th of November. And I think it's a very proud moment, not just for ESB, but entire Ireland Inc, because um, it's a significant opportunity for us to showcase what's going on in the country. And I'm expecting to see many of you in the audience to be present at that day, including Liam and the others. And um, the winner of the free electrons program for the fifth edition will be announced that day, who's gonna walk away with $200,000 prize money with absolutely no strings attached as well. So please mark it in your diary, the 10th of November, which is the Open Innovation Day. So to conclude, I suppose, um, you know, with Free Electrons, we have um, built a, a multi-dimensional, uh, multicultural global platform, um, you know, where startups, utilities, um, governments all kind of, you know, come together to engage in this um, innovation space. And even from ESB point of view, to be involved in this fantastic program, to be able to work with the global utilities, global startup companies, the experience has been priceless for me and for my colleagues. And someday, you know, hopefully we will offer those electrons for free to the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ratna. That was, that was really a very interesting um, presentation. Figure, some of the impressive figures in there that, um, I think what we there's a recording we made of, of this webinar, which will be available on the Maori website in due course. And I hope as well we'll be able to share the presentations from our various presenters. But really interesting, Ratna, thank you for that. Our presenter is Neil Collins, who is manager of the, the new AgTech Innovation Center in Lions Farm in UCD. So um Neil. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Liam. Um, sorry, just want to uh, put that into the uh, slideshare format. Okay, can you see my screen? You can. You need to change the setting there, Neve. Great. Um, control panel is blocking <laughs> blocking my view my um access there we go we got it yes that's great thank you okay uh apologies for that i work for ag tech but tech is not my strong point so i do apologize 
Um, Liam, thank you for that introduction. Uh, my name is Neve Collins and I am the Centre Manager for the AgTech UCD Innovation Centre. Um, along with my colleague Anton, he is the Centre Director and uh, we're at the very, very early stages of the development of this centre. Uh, between Anton and myself, we probably have combined experience of about 30 years. Anton has over 20 years experience working in the ag tech and bioeconomy sector. He has had his own startup, which he sold in 2010. He has a farming background. He also owns his own farm. And for the last four years, he has worked for the European Investment Bank in the agri sector. With myself, um, I started with the ag tech UCD um, just in February. Uh, prior to that, for 12 years, I was centre manager of another innovation centre in Dublin, and we delivered, designed and delivered accelerator programmes for different sectors and verticals, um, but all with uh, the early stage startups. So that's, that's who the team is at the moment leading the AgTech UCD. So where do we come from? So AgTech UCD is an entity of Nova UCD. Um, Nova UCD is based on the Belfield campus along with the rest of UCD and that's the beautiful images of the Nova facilities. Uh, Nova is the centre for new ventures and entrepreneurs. Um, it has over 20 years experience uh, growing and scaling startups and has supported over 385 startups during that time. And the, those startups have raised 760 million in equity. So while we have access to the NOVA facilities and the mentors and expertise and the training, we're not going to be based in NOVA. Uh, we are going to be based um, on the UCD Lions Farm in Kildare. This is a 250 hectare farm based in Selbridge. 200 of those hectares are gra grassland, 50 are crops, and there's dairy, beef, cattle, pigs, and equine. It's a live working farm, um, and there's also researchers on site and the vet school. So when the centre, as I mentioned, we are in the early stages of development, and our building is not built yet, but the image on the left side of the screen is the architect's image of what the centre will look like. And we will be built on the farm, and that will happen in the second half of this year. So when AgTech UCD is up and running and we have the Innovation Centre built, we will have co-working spaces, laboratories, closed door offices, meetings and conference rooms, and large exhibition space. And these will all benefit the startups that we're going to be working with. So between Anton and myself, we will be start, uh, supporting startups at the very, very early stages of their business development. And I should say at this stage, both Irish startups and European startups. And startups don't have to be fully established businesses. They can be from the research community. Um, or people with great ideas uh, for ag tech, vet tech, bio ag tech, food tech space. When the startups come on board with us, um, we they will have access to the UCD Lions Farm for testing and experimentation. They'll also have access to the UCD food, food processing facility and also to UCD researchers. Um, so if further research needs to be done on the product or service, we'll be able to make those connections and collaborations. The centre itself will also run innovation challenge events uh, with corporates, and we have some of those lined up for the second half of this year. We'll also be running hackathons, and we'll start our monthly webinar series in May. Our first webinar will be on the 13th of May, and it'll be similar to today's event, guest speakers and panellists. And we're also at the planning stages of our national and international conferences, and they'll take place in the latter half of this year and next year. But one of the focuses that I have this year is the Accelerator Program, which we're launching in June. Um, we are the AgTech UCD Centre, but it's not just AgTech that we want to work with. We want to work with early stage startups, or we want to at least hear from them who are working in the vet tech sensors, IoT software, big data, robotics, I won't name them all, also in the bioeconomy, food, feed, materials, energy. So these are the types of uh, startups and um, you know, research ideas that we'd like to hear from and we'd like to work with. I just thought I would mention some of the Irish startups. So even though we don't have a physical building yet and we're doing a lot of our work remotely as everybody is, we are working and already have started to work with startups on site um, at the Lions Farm. So these are just four that I've picked out. They're Irish startups, Provi, Carbon Harvesters, The Cotter Crate and Fresh Graze. 
Uh, two of them are spin outs of UCD. And if I could just um, focus on fresh grays at the top left hand corner, this is an automated moving fence system that moves every couple of hours to allow the cows to have fresh grass and um, fresh grazing. So fresh graze will have six days of on of on site testing at the farm in the month of April. All four of these um, startups will be using the farm and they'll also get access to the expertise, the researchers, the farm managers on site um, when they come in in April. So I just thought I'd show you a flavour of the companies that we're already working with. I mentioned earlier that um, one of my focus is on the accelerator programme. So we will run an accelerator program on ag tech, bio ag tech, bioeconomy and startups. It's a 12 week intensive accelerator program. It will start in September. We'll open the application process in June and we'll be shortlisting and scouting throughout the summer. Um, but when the program starts, it will be run remotely on a Tuesday and Thursday morning. We'll be delivering business development workshops. The startups will have access to mentors. They'll get a mentor when they arrive for the duration of the program. We'll also do speed mentoring. They'll get brand profiling, access to corporates, trialing and experimentation at the Lions Farm. <clears throat> and the whole way through the accelerator program, we will be getting the companies investor ready and we'll be doing training with them. They will deliver then to an investor or a VC angel panel then in December. December 9th is their showcase day. And I should say that the recruitment is for Irish and European startups. Um, we'll also work actively work on an active uh, alumni network. And those companies are the logos you see at the bottom of the screen. They've already agreed to work with us. So there are some of the corporates that we'll be working with and the VCs. And um, in the last two weeks, we have partnered with a US accelerator called Thrive uh, Agri-Food Accelerator. They're a global ac uh, accelerator program uh, based in Silicon Valley. And they also run innovation challenges. Um, they've most recently run one in Canada and in Africa. And on the 7th of October, 2021, they will be running their Europe challenge. Um, and applications for that are now open. And basically the challenge is around solving problems for the agri-food industry in Europe. And the website's at the bottom of the page if anybody is interested in that. So that's, that's a brief overview of the work that Antoine and myself are doing and planning to do. And at the moment, we're very busy building the ecosystem and getting all our events and programs up and running. But if anybody wishes to contact us, our details are there and we're happy to have further discussions. So thank you, Liam, and thank you for listening. Thanks so much, um, Neil. I'm just, my, yeah, I'm having a little bit of a problem starting my video. There you are. Okay. So uh, thanks for that, Neil. Very interesting and exciting development for the Irish um, startup ecosystem, the ag tech uh, ecosystem in particular, to have this great resource coming online. And um, should mention that we, we hope that Antoine will be able to join us for the panel discussion piece. In a if I can just, just copy there, Antoine is here, so he will join the panel and I'll go off now and have a coffee. <laughs> excellent, excellent, super stuff. So our last speaker before we start uh, into that uh, panel discussion is all the way from Canada. Don Grant is executive director of the Ocean Startup Project, really interesting project that's going on over in Canada. And uh, he very kindly has uh, joined us today to talk a little bit about that. So Don, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Liam. Really, really appreciate the uh, invitation here today. And I'm just uh, so impressed and excited to hear about all of the stuff that's going on in Ireland and, and really pleased to be here as a, an international participant and talk a little bit about what we're doing in Canada. I promise folks, I'll keep this short and, and there will be things that are relevant to everybody here. There are offerings coming out of the Ocean Startup Project and, and Canada that uh, everybody on this call who is uh, thinking about ocean specific innovation can take advantage of. So the Ocean Startup Project folks is a, is a pan-Canadian collaboration between a whole bunch of different organizations uh, and provinces in Canada. And what we are trying to do is really just take advantage of all of the opportunity that we see in the ocean sector in that blue economy right now. 
And our goal is to make Canada the best place in the world to launch and grow an ocean company. And I know what Liam's doing and everybody on this call is doing. So we, we have stiff competition and we're a long way away from being the best place in the world to start, grow and foster an ocean company. But that is the end goal for us. The reason that we are, are focused on this right now is there's a lot of things happening in Canada around the ocean economy. We have Canada's Ocean Super Cluster, which is a, a conglomeration between industry and, and our federal government coming together to invest $300 million into the ocean sector. Um, we have a blue economy strategy being undertaken by our Minister of Fisheries and Oceans here in Canada as well. So really the focus is uh, on the ocean sector in a very big way in Canada. So these are just a couple of the companies that we have coming out of uh, our ocean sector right now. And these are companies that are making a really, really big impact globally in the ocean economy. Uh, the, the names you see along the bottom, the Planetary Hydrogen Qualities, Glass Ocean, these are all projects and, and companies that are associated with the Ocean Startup Project, very early stage, but we think will have a really, really big impact in the coming days. We are supporting these companies with, with funding, but also mentorship and, and programming along the way. What we're doing this year, folks, and this is where it becomes relevant for everybody on this call, is we are going to be giving away 1.4 million Canadian dollars in funding for new ocean tech startups. Based on the strength of our currency, that's probably about 11 euro, but in actual fact, it's, it's a million euro. And, and, and really what we're wanting to do is we wanna find those very, very early stage ideas. And we want to draw out that innovation here in Canada and around the world. And so people internationally are welcome to apply to this, uh, to this Ocean Startup Challenge. The challenge will open in, uh, at the end of this month, at the end of this month, March 30th. And, and we're focused on a few different areas that we think Canada has a, a real advantage at, and that's marine bioresources, offshore energy, fishing and aquaculture, naval and defense, and shipping and marine transportation. And so we're going to be giving away different streams of funds. We have Idea Stream, $25,000. We have the Growth Stream, $100,000. And then we have this Ocean Shot, this really big idea that if you can solve a, a really big problem uh, in the oceans, probably mainly around climate change. We wanna see if we can't help you help you do that. When we say growth stage, I just wanna be clear, we're still talking really, really early stage. And that is sort of TRL four to seven. So, so still very, very early stage stuff. Other things that we do in the Ocean Startup Project, as Brian talked about at the beginning of this, we're trying to get researchers to get that research commercialized. So we want to take things from the lab to the market. And we know here in Canada that we have a ton of researchers who are doing incredible things in the lab, but aren't really focused on commercialization. So we run a lab to market program. It's a seven week intense program that tries to help develop the skills around entrepreneurship. The other thing that we have, which is particularly relevant to uh, innovators on this call, is CDL uh, Atlantic Ocean Stream. And this is a mentorship and milestone based program that is for massively scalable companies. And so I want to talk a little bit about more about CDL because it's 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 a internationally renowned program. It's uh, it's it's open to everybody around the world and it's focused on many different things, but there is an ocean stream to this. So it's it's a nine month seed stage program. It's five intensive sessions. It takes no equity or, or charges no fees. And it's it's essentially founders meet these curated group of investors, these experienced mentors who can help them guide their projects along. And sometimes there's, there's capital uh, being raised from the mentors at the end. So again, CDL is, CDL is an internationally renowned uh, program. It's not based solely out of Atlantic Canada. There's, there's CDL Oxford, Paris, uh, Atlanta. It's, it's all over the world and, and uh, a program worth looking into. 
So this is some of the Ocean Stream mentors. These are people who have uh, deep expertise in oceans, investment, uh, company uh, uh, formulation. And these are people that will work with your early stage startup to help it get on the proper foundation during that uh, nine month uh, stream. And so folks here in Canada, we just want to stay connected. If you have any questions about the Ocean Startup Project, we would love to answer them. There's a lot of great things happening in the ocean sector. And we're really focused on collaborating both across Canada, but internationally. And we know that uh, through uh, collaboration comes really, really great innovation. And there's a lot of opportunity, probably largely because of COVID, um, to, to collaborate internationally, uh, just like we're doing here today. So thank you so much for uh, having me and I'm uh, looking forward to the panel discussion. Great, thanks so much, Don. Um, I think there's, there's so much that uh, we can learn here in Ireland from some of the activities and, and the work that you guys are doing in Canada. And maybe just to, to point out that one of our, um, I suppose, quite a prominent startup in the Irish marine and maritime sector, uh, Ocean, X-Ocean, uh, I think is uh, an alumnus of, of CDL Oceans. So that's a, that's a, a connection that, that we have with you guys over there. So uh, at this point, we, we're going to start our panel discussion. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get everybody on screen. I think people's cameras now are currently turned off. So if we can maybe turn on our camera and we'll, um, we'll look to kick things off. So I think I'm seeing, I'm seeing pretty much everybody, hopefully. Yeah, we've, okay, I'm not seeing Brendan. Um, I think the host has to let me switch my camera on apparently. So. So the machine tells me. Okay, thank you. Okay, so excellent. So just maybe things off a little bit in terms of of, um, of discussing what we've just seen, and there's so much there's so much that that we've just heard, right? And just reiterate, we'll we we'll, we'll look to make this recording is going to be made available on the Marai website subsequent to this and, and and presentations also, but. To kick things off, Brendan, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, you know, in, in interacting with people that, that would know that I was involved in this and people would ask you, you know, how are things going on the registrations and so on. And uh, I'd say, you know, we have 200 people registered now and they go, but that's very uh, impressive for such a niche area and um, sustainability. And it really, I, it's, it's had me thinking over the last week or so you know, about sustainability being niche. And from my perspective, really, sustainability is anything but niche because there are there's such a requirement right now to um, for us to be more sustainable and there's such opportunity for efficiency and, and for circularity and for all of this. So just want to ask you the question, Brenda, and it's as much a philosophical question maybe as anything, but what does sustainability mean to you? <laughs> Is that a philosophical question or a rhetorical question? And that, well, it's not rhetorical, certainly, anyway. Uh, I guess in my in my role, we see we see the the term bandied about um, a, a fair bit, and very very loosely as well. It's 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 kind of taken on as somewhat of a, an abstract notion. It's a bit like the word digital when we talk about technology. I mean, everything is digital. Um, a bit of, there's a bit of feedback coming. I'm not sure if everybody else is getting it, but I'm finding it difficult to. Yes, there's a bit of feedback there. If other people could mute their microphones for the moment, please. Thank you. Uh, that's... Cool, that's better. Um, you know who you are. Thank you very much. But I think sustainability is critical. It permeates pretty much every industry, every vertical. There's a huge level of, um, there's a huge momentum in terms of establishing transparency across all business sectors, you know, particularly publicly owned businesses. Uh, there's a lot of shareholder uh, agitation to ensure that sustainability becomes tangible and isn't just, you know, greenwashing has become a serious issue. 
So the tangibility of, of a company's strategy around sustainability is becoming more and more important. So effectively, there's, there's a greater sense of obligation on businesses at all levels now to actually prove they're being sustainable or that their credentials are legitimate. So I guess, listen, what, what does sustainability mean? It means being cognizant of the impact that your service or product has on the climate. Um, and you know the cost benefit analysis of, of what you're actually doing is it having a positive or a negative effect fundamentally. And we can take that from the grassroots level as individuals in terms of our own personal behavior. Uh, and we can escalate that right up and multiply it across commercial, industry, government level as well. So it's ultimately all about taking individual and collective responsibility for ensuring that our impact on the environment is, is positive and that any negative impact we have is, is minimal or at least mitigated against. Absolutely, I concur with that. And there's such an onus really, isn't there, on, on startups and early stage businesses who are innovative, who are nimble, who, are, who can move quickly to solve problems and can iterate and, and change and pivot and all of those good things. Um, so there's, there's such a, I think, an onus on startups. And Ratna, you mentioned some of the startups that you know, have been through the program, um, the Free Electrons program previously. Maybe could you just talk a little bit about what their journey has been on Free Electrons and, and what they've achieved? You're on mute right now. Sorry, can you hear me there? Can you hear me here? Yeah? Uh, we can hear you now, right yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, it's just trying to kind of, you know, switch. Um, so just in terms of the startup, um, you know, it, like every year, ESV on an average has done at least three to five pilots. And uh, a lot of pilots have been a huge success for ESV. And more than just doing the pilots, you know, we have, um, you know, learned from the other utilities experience as well. But just to kind of, you know, give you a couple of examples. In 2018, we partnered with a, a friend startup company called Stirblue. Um, they build uh, a platform for a, a, you know, automatic inspection of wind turbine blades using autonomous drones and also with AI kind of, you know, at the back end. Now, normally the regular inspection of turbine blades, um, towers and other components is the only way for us to ensure that, you know, the optimal and the safe performance of the wind turbines. So the autonomous drone inspection, um, you know, is definitely by far a, a superior method when compared to flying a drone manually or also uh, applying like traditional methods, you know, using binoculars or cameras. And I suppose the data that has been collected by these drones, the autonomous drones, um, provided a, a timeline, a digital timeline uh, of the damage regression uh, and has allowed ESB to incorporate more advanced, um, you know, preventive maintenance techniques. So in addition to that, I suppose, um, so we went through like, you know, a couple of trial phases, you know, initially we did 15 wind turbines. And then we extended the pilot by doing another 50 wind turbines. So it's not that, you know, just by doing a, a first pilot, you know, we decided that, you know, this was a success and let's let's sign a contract with Sturblue. Or we did an extended trial as well, you know, which proved that this was a low cost, flexible, and it can be more routine and more safer solution compared to the uh, manned helicopter kind of operation. So today, as I speak, you know, we have um, signed a framework contract with Sturblue you know, for um, inspection of our, all our wind turbines. And I suppose the other key example, this is a fantastic one, right? Um, we worked with a, um, a startup company, uh, a Swiss startup company called Axelos. And we developed, now this, this is interesting, we developed the world's first digital twin of pumped hydroelectric power station. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with Turlock Hill. And this pump hydro station is, is the Turlock Hill one. And using their proprietary software, we created this advanced uh, simulation um, of this pump hydro, um, which helped us in kind of, you know, determining the remaining design life um, of, of, of this asset, you know, which has been a huge success for ESP. And also not only huge success for ESP, but it's ha it has gone to win many awards internationally and also in, in Ireland. So these are a couple of examples, but I can go on, Liam, you know, as I said, you know, we've signed, we've done more than 160 pilots and ESB ourselves, if you take on an average like five pilots a year, you know, we've done more than like 20 odd pilots at this stage and a number of them have been a huge success. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Ratna. And maybe to bring Antoine in here at this point, Antoine, you're very welcome in the first instance. And 
you know, Ratna was talking about some of the technologies that are gaining traction from a sustainability perspective and um, partners. What are the sustainability opportunities and technologies particularly relevant uh, to you, Antoine? So first of all, before we start into discussing about sustainability, you, I'm sure that everybody is aware that in the EU, we have the, the most powerful regulation body on earth. And uh, any people that wants to work uh, on, on sustainability has to fulfill you know, the EU Green Deal, uh, EU taxonomy that's coming in 2022 and so on. So that's just to, for, for the, the attendants to be aware of that. Because as Brendan was mentioning about the greenwashing, it won't be allowed anymore in the EU with, through the taxonomy. The taxonomy is going to tell you which, what is green and not green. And then you have to tick boxes. But that's very important for, for people to know if they want to involve into the EU market that I, I think we are the best in the world for regulation, that's for sure. But so many regulation. I worked for the last four years at the European Investment Bank and I was part of the of many working groups, you know, working on the taxonomy, on the, on the new CAP and so on. So, Bear in mind, if you want to start a new project, uh, a startup, and you want to be to be sure that your project uh, fulfills many sustainability criteria, that you all align with the EU regulation, because they are very, they're going to push you forward sustainability very, very hard, especially the Green Deal. So that's that's my first comment. And then on sustainability, sustainability, uh, we have two keywords in the ag and food tech. Is um, so basically this is. Uh, anything related to efficiency and resilience. Um, so I can give you some, some, some. Um, how can I put it? Some example, if you want. But efficiency and resilience. We we have to produce the same amount or, or more with less resources. As, especially, we have to avoid depletion of finite, finite resources. That's the, the keyword. Um, and if, and resilience. Uh, especially due to climate, anything that's related to climate adaptation is going to be one of the main driver in future, you know, for, for ag and food. So efficiency and resilience are the two keywords. So I can give you some example today, the, the big trends, we call it the signal. Uh, the big signal is today is to produce away from traditional ways of producing food. For instance, the milk alternative, the plant-based one, you know, to try to move away from uh, uh, a very intensive meat production that you like it or not this is the this is a trend because some of the people they don't want to hit me to hit meat for personal reasons but also they try to reduce the meat consumption for for environment so meat alternative is a big trend right now and meat analogs even more uh, meat analogs is producing meat uh, using a fermenter so th that that's one thing and also vertical indoor farming so this is some example of products producing away from traditional way of producing food so that's one of the major signal on the market today and like i think we we receive a data from a uh, act funder actually plant-based plant-based food uh, startups is, is close to 1300 startups in the world uh, evolving in that area so it's immense the everybody wants to be wants to do to hit on the big pie um, but we have noises you know noises market noises what, what will come after those signal uh, on sustainability so i can give you some example genetic the new breeding technique uh, we get more and more uh, techniques coming into the genetic way uh, either for animals or for crops uh, sustainability and why sustainability because at one moment for climate adaptation you know the the crops they have to resist drought and it waves more and more. So genetic is, is a one part of the solution, not the only tool that we have in our hands, but one part of the, the solution. So we will see more and more genetic uh, improvement in the coming years and not non-GMOs because EU it's, it's out of the question, but new breeding technique and even new breeding technique is, is considered as GMO by the EU commission, but maybe tomorrow we will have even techniques that not NBT like nanocarbon, I don't want to, 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 to be too, to enter into too much tech um, devices, but the, the carrier, you know, the carrier uh, that can carry uh, our DNA to, do, to the cell, it is not considered as NBT, NBT today. So genetics and, and the other one uh, I would like to emphasize is uh, very rapidly is the, um, uh, the bio inputs. Another example, bio inputs, because today we use pesticide and it was a great it was very great for humankind that people like it or not, because without that, we would be, you know, we live in Ireland. 
remember the, the starvation in 1842, uh, how many people left for, for because of potato blight. We have to remind history. We have to, to be careful about history. But for today, we try to get away from synthetic pesticides that have more environmentally friendly pesticides, which is called the biopesticides. So this is a big trend. And we have to, and we are forced by you to go to that direction because it's part of the farm to fork strategy. So some examples, very quick examples. That's great. Thanks so much, Antoine. And um, we're running a little bit tight on time here. So I'm just going to ask Don one question. I have to ask about the, the Ocean Solutions Exchange, Don, and, and the work that's going on there. Um, really interesting. I know that you've had a number of, of uh, webinars now where you've you know, brought together business, you know, the, the research community from all over the world to talk about what are the challenges in particular sectors. So, you know, the fisheries and agriculture one was one that I looked at recently, but talk to us a little bit about that, how you're finding that process of, of going out, asking where the challenges are so that startups then can come and, and solve those challenges. Yeah, Liam, it's really interesting that it's been a, it's been a great exercise for us and we've uh, benefited from COVID actually on that front because, you know, there's a lot of people out there looking for opportunities to speak where they would otherwise have been in person. So we've gotten access to some really, really high level people who uh, understand certain industries incredibly well and know the problems. And so the really interesting thing I think that's relevant for anybody who's thinking about starting a company and isn't sure where that market will exist what, uh, what we've learned through the Ocean Solutions Exchange is that these large companies, the, the biggest companies in the world, they're looking to startups to solve problems for them. They don't have that ability. Somebody mentioned nimbleness and they don't have the nimbleness necessarily to solve a lot of the problems that, that exist. And so they're looking for startups to come in and help them find efficiencies, find sustainable solutions, and really help them grow their business. So it's there's a ton of opportunity out there to work with these big industry players. And that's what we have really tried to capture here in Canada with the Ocean Startup Project is, is really to try and marry traditional big industry with some of the startups, uh, both from a mentorship perspective, uh, from a mentorship perspective, but also getting those industry players to tell us what their problems are and, and how, uh, how they, they need them solved. That's fantastic, John. And I'm really excited maybe into the future to see how we can collaborate in terms of um, the, the Canadian Irish connection and the blue economy, because I think there's, there's an awful lot to do there. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I totally agree, Liam. And, and I, I loved your, your point on X ocean. X Ocean is sort of a, a, an incredible company that is, that is scaling massively right now out of Ireland. They're actually building vessels here in Nova Scotia, which we're very proud of as well, and, and really proud to see the growth of that company and, and see in a very short period of time. Great story. So at this point, I'd just like to thank all of my contributors so far, Brendan, Ratna, Neve, Don, Antoine, um, and... At this point, we're going to introduce the next part of, uh, oh, some of the questions. So those questions in the Q&A, given we're getting a little bit tight on time, I just ask the, the presenters we've just had, and uh, maybe you could look at answering some of those questions in the Q&A as we move forward. So I'm just going to share my screen now, um, hopefully, and we'll, we'll move on to the, to, the, to the next exciting part of our, um, of our, if I can move on. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that, but the next part of our, of our webinar really is to, is to introduce the, the online masterclass series and startup competition, which commences next Thursday, April 1st. Um, so really excited about this, um, about this competition and masterclass series. And before going any further, I just want to acknowledge uh, our supporters and sponsors who have made all of this possible. And I want to particularly um, say thank you to the local enterprise office, and in particular to the three local enterprise offices in Cork, led by Sean O'Sullivan, Kevin Kern, and Paul McGurk, because they have made the, the competition piece and have sponsored the prizes for the competition piece. So we're very thankful for that. Um, 
the master classes will be facilitated by two really um, interesting people. Um, firstly, we have Ron Imick, who describes himself at times as a, a Dutch Irish entrepreneur, uh, a big fan of, of books and, and the power of books. Um, he's been involved in sustainable development programs uh, in Ireland through the Climate Kick, Climate Launchpad. He advises the Sustainable Finance Ireland um, organization uh, and really has a very, very deep knowledge of this area. Um, Judy Russell is a, a video specialist. She has worked with people like Sky TV and on programs like you see on screen there, The Fear and Young Offenders, which is a very, uh, a very popular program here in Ireland. You also see her on screen interviewing Brendan Gleeson. So, um, does really high quality work around video and and is helping entrepreneurs with their with their video um, using video for their purposes. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hopefully um, Ron and uh, Judy will pop up. So I can see Ron and hopefully Judy is there somewhere as well. So there she is. So as was first and foremost, Ron and Judy, you're both very welcome. Um, we we get a chance we get a chance to go through I suppose you know what the masterclass series will be all about what you see as being you know the approach and what success will look like and all that good stuff but maybe in order to kind of orientate ourselves initially um, if I could ask you and I'll start with Ron on this one if I could ask you Ron just maybe to introduce yourself to the audience and just give us a feel for who you are. Okay, so I, I'm Ron uh, Imink is my last name, and that's not an Irish name, that's actually a Dutch name. I fell in love with an Irish girl in 1994, moved over to Ireland, learned to drink Guinness. Uh, I then wrote a book about business planning that, uh, and that, that, started writing, that started me writing other books. So I'm, I, I'm an author. I've been living in Ireland for the last 25 years. My background is in... Uh, entrepreneurship. I've managed the Innovation Center in DCU. I've worked with a lot of large companies on innovation and entrepreneurship. And since 2017, I decided to move to Spain, hence my strange uh, color. So I'm enjoying the sun, reading books, writing books, and helping companies to be successful, particularly around the area of climate change and innovation and strategy. Excellent. Thanks for that, Ryan. And similar question to you, Judy. Maybe you might give us uh, an introduction to who Judy Russell is. Sure. And you know what? I always begin with, with, with a very quick video. So I'm just going to put you through this for one second. What's your name? Um, Judy Russell. Judy what? Judy Russell. Judy what, Russell? Judy Russell Breeder. So that is the beginning of my video career at four years old when my parents got a camcorder and I became obsessed with the whole thing. However, I went to school and my confidence was knocked completely out of me. And I was like, OK, I can't do that anymore. I'm going to have to be normal. So I was lucky now to do. I went to UCC and did a master's in business economics, which was great, but I knew I'd never work in it. So I went traveling and I was away for five years working in any job I could find until I landed in Costa Rica and this job came up on Craigslist for a news spokeswoman. So I had no idea if I was going to be murdered in the interview or anything. Thankfully, I wasn't. It was a real company. And I stayed there for two years presenting to camera, writing scripts and uh, learning all about this whole video world. And to be honest, I thought that every company had one of these studios in the back of their business, like what, what the Costa Rican company had. And it's only now since I suppose March last year that companies are considering investing in this area. So it's really exciting now for me to see it, even though I feel like it's taken way longer than it should have taken, it's finally happening. And um, so that was the beginning of it. Then I went on to study it I actually had to come home and learn about the technical aspects of it because I was I was kind of jealous of the boys they were they were doing all the lighting and the sound and the, the backgrounds and stuff but I was like I want to know that stuff too so came back and did a 12-month course and then ever since then that was 10 years ago I've been working as an editor a presenter camera person the young offenders the fear um on Irish tv so it's, it's been a very varied um kind of background and now what I do is I teach people so I try to merge everything that I've learned into a course that helps people to firstly I suppose get better at presenting to camera and then secondly at creating videos planning filming and editing videos so that they can communicate their message 24 hours a day seven days a week without having to do it 
being there physically. So that's my background. Brilliant. Yeah. And, and video is such a powerful medium. Maybe we might talk a little bit about that in a while. But Ron, I, I came across a quote, uh, a quote from George Bernard Shaw recently. And, and I, th I thought of you actually when, when I saw the quote, right? And the quote is that people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those doing it. And in the context of entrepreneurship and, and the kind of action orientation required to be an entrepreneur, I think it's a it's an interesting an interesting quote. What do you think? Well, it, it, there's a, it's it's interesting on a number of, of uh, aspects because a, a long time ago, a friend of mine wrote a book called My Family, the, the Myth of Family Support, which is about the reaction when you have a steady job and you have heard the masterclass about entrepreneurship and you get inspired and you come home and you tell your partner, "Listen, love." I have decided to start my own business. And normally the response is not, oh, love, that's fantastic. It's actually the opposite. And uh, when you then take uh, entrepreneurship, which is being entrepreneurial in a large organization, most entrepreneurs eventually get fired because large organizations just don't like uh, people doing different things. But if you study the labor market, I think in the future where careers have a lifespan of maybe four or five years, but technology becomes all invasive. I think your only future is to become an entrepreneur on the labor market. So doing is incredibly important. And then what there is always a misunderstanding around uh, entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship most definitely is not about the idea. That's about 5% of, of, of entrepreneurship, but there's actually 95% execution. And a friend of mine have, have been talking about this. Actually, entrepreneurship is incredibly boring. It is 95% doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and doing it consistently. And then the other part of it is, is the selling part, which is also doing. That doesn't just happen. That has something you have to, to do. So doing is very much underestimated in the context of entrepreneurship. Absolutely. I, I hope I hope people will stay on the call now, Ron, after hearing that the description of entrepreneurship of being 95% just doing boring things. It's more exciting, <laughs> of course. But but Judy, going back to what you mentioned about, about video and, and you know the significance of video, and, and you mentioned about you were surprised in a way that it didn't become more mainstream or more significant quicker. You know, talking about video as a, a medium of communication in 2021. Well, you know, like when I was when I left Costa Rica, I was thinking I'm coming back to Ireland and I'm going to set up a corporate video business because all businesses are going to need to make video at the time. And to be honest, it was a tough sell. Like I remember people being like, oh, I don't think we need video. And I was like, I think you do. And then I was like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they actually don't need video. Maybe I've got this all wrong. And, and you know, so it's it's nice to be kind of like, just to, well, it's not nice because it's, I suppose it's sped up so quickly because of this whole coronavirus that I suppose people are realizing, but I think it would have got there anyway, just maybe it would have taken a little bit longer, but just some stats is that like, HubSpot in 2018, and this is probably more now than what was back in 2018, but like 54% of consumers want to see more video content from a brand or organization that they support. 50% of people will stop what they're doing to watch a video from an organization that they trust, which is, you know, incredible. And then in 2022, um, some research has proven that 82% of global internet traffic will come from video streaming and downloads. So I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but like, I find it difficult to read these days. If I go onto a website and there's loads of information, I'm like, oh, I can't read that. I'm like, where's their video? <laughs> I'm scrolling around looking for their video because that's kind of what I like to consume. And I, I can just imagine what it's gonna be like for the TikTok generation who are, you know, producing and taking and sending each other videos, communicating everything through video. So I feel like the longer it takes you to get on board and learn about this, the more difficult it will be for you in the future. And I'd almost go as far as saying your video skills will almost be as in demand as PowerPoint skills in like five to 10 years time. Again, I could be wrong. I'm wrong a lot. Oh, it's it's very interesting. And, and as you say, you talk about the TikTok generation and, and young people now. I have a teenage son. He's 13, um, turned 13 in, in August of last year. So he's now able to have a TikTok account. Started from the standing start in December. At the end of, of February, he had a thousand followers. Okay. 
He now has five and a half thousand followers. He's absolutely obsessed with, with football, with soccer. He's a, a Tottenham Hotspur supporter, um, uh, which is a bit of a challenge in its own right at the moment because they're, they're not doing particularly well. But, but in terms of the, of the reach of video, I was chatting with him earlier uh, in preparation for this. So from a standing start in December, he now has, on his TikToks, which are all football associated, over a million views of his videos, which is just, in terms of reach, is just is, is phenomenal. So the power of video, I think, really, and as you say, you come on a website, you're immediately drawn to where is the video that explains this to me. Um, so I think it's an, it's an interesting one. Ron, just to pop back to you on, in terms of, and we're, we're getting tight on time, so I just make yes. sure to know that, you know, what to expect, I suppose. Uh, you're going to be running the Masterclass series on the 1st of April and also on the 15th of April. So you, maybe you might give us a flavour of... Yeah, so the, the, it will be, the, 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 uh, nearly four parts. So uh, when you register, we will send you some reading materials for you to prepare for the session on the 1st of, uh, of April. What I will do, and I will try to make it as interactive as, as possible, but that's going to be difficult with lots of people, is to, to, to talk you to a number of startup methodologies that we uh, apply. And the one we are focused on is one that we particularly use in the area of, of uh, climate. And we keep it as, as simple and as sharp as, uh, as possible. Then we will give you what I've done is because I think in books, so I think video is lovely, but books are way, way better than video uh, because it's a video in your own head. Uh, we will give you another book which actually covers some conflicting perspectives on business planning strategy and, uh, and then hopefully in the, the next session we will go to more a strategic perspective on entrepreneurship and the steps you need to take to move to the next stage. And in between, I will always be available by email to answer any type of question. That's, that's brilliant, Ron. And I think it's uh, important to let people know that, and you, you've already articulated this, but this, this, this will be about giving people you know, methodologies, uh, content, uh, some cheat sheets in terms of uh, books that are relevant and, and, and how they might be summarized. But really, there's a lot of work needs to go on by the people involved in the masterclass to get full value from it, it's fair to say, isn't it? Ron is after freezing on us. But Judy, to go to you, you'll be looking, looking to, I suppose, bring it all together on the 22nd of April um, and looking to help people with the video piece of this. So maybe you might give us a bit of an overview of, of how you intend to approach that. Sure, so for the first section, I'd hoped to speak about presenting tips and techniques and kind of some equipment. So, you know, I try to not make people buy anything, you know, except for maybe things like a microphone or trying to improve their sound in easy ways. Then, you know, like lights can be household lamps. It doesn't have to be buying anything and improving the background, making sure that the camera is in the correct position for presenting to camera, things like that. Then I will go into the eight steps for planning a video because as part of your deliverable in this, you're going to have to you know, deliver a pitch video. So we'll try and run through a planning process that I've been using for many years that just simplifies it and makes you think of things that you that a lot of people say that they wouldn't have thought about until after and then it's too late. And then in the final part, I just wanna give you a quick editing demonstration using a so desktop software that you can download for free and use for free for the duration of this, but it is a paid software. But I just wanna give you a look at how you can use it for the purpose of this deliverable um, using the free trial kind of part of it so that you can deliver something as part of this um, challenge or this, this contest that's really, really professional looking and you know speak to your your idea well that's brilliant thanks so much for that judy and, and we've worked together before on, on these types of uh, videos and and the the outcomes have been amazing and um, so i'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what people produce ultimately after your, uh, tuition around it so i think ron is gone judy thanks so much for um coming on and, and talking to us today um, i'm just going to go and look at some of the admin side of things here so i'm going to sh share my screen again Okay, so hopefully people can see the screen now. So I'm just going to maybe talk through, you know, some of the some of when things are happening. So we have three master classes. They'll run from 11 a.m. to 12:30 p.m. on three three dates in April. The first of April will be Ron, and he look at startup methodologies that work and why. And second um, second master class from Ron on the 15th of April, applying the strategic box, passion, purpose. 
um, and I can't see the third one myself because my my and positioning because uh, the cameras are underway. And and third the third session will be on April twenty second with Judy Russell, and that's around design, create, and deliver a great video pitch. The the competition itself then will involve you submitting a video pitch and uh, and some details short application form of one or two pages max. So you have a at maximum three minutes of a video to submit. It doesn't need to be three minutes, could be two minutes if that is sufficient for you. And the deadline on that is May 6th. Uh, we'll have three um, top three pitches with we'll three categories in the first instance, and we'll have three prize winners in each category and, and each prize winner uh, will win a cash prize. Uh, we're going to have a final online event where we will announce the winner of each category and the two runners up of each category and that is planned right now for June 3rd but is subject to change. So we'll have full details uh, of, of the competition and associated information available on the MARI website um, shortly. So what are the next steps? So um, firstly, Everybody that's online right now will receive a link to the first masterclass on April 1st by email. Okay, so you'll get an email through Eventbrite with a link to the April 1st masterclass. We will continue to use that Eventbrite, Eventbrite page to take registrations from now on. For anybody that may not have been able to make our event today, for example, but might like to be involved in the masterclass series and ultimately maybe the competition. So, the message is tell your friends and it's the same um, link as you would have used to register. And finally, only those who are registered will receive the links, updates, the materials that Dan spoke, or Ron spoke about uh, and the various content, which will be a big part of, of, of this uh, series um, for, during April. So I think all that's left to be said at this point is thank you. For, for being online uh, today. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, Tara Reddington and Aoife Dunn, who have been um, behind the scenes, making sure everything worked according to plan. So thank you very much, ladies. Thank you to all of my uh, Maori colleagues, and in particular to Dee O'Connor and to Karen O'Callaghan, who helped out a lot in terms of the communications work and so on over the last number of weeks. So my details are up on screen at the moment, if anybody wants to discuss any aspect of what we discussed today further or, or, or wants to communicate with me, there are my details and I'm more than happy to um, respond to an email or, or even take a call if that's what somebody would like. So I think that's it. I think we're going to log off at this point. Thanks once again to everybody and I hope to see you soon.